Good morning and welcome to the Springs. Please join us as we worship together through song. You give light, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. that you are our everything. 
We thank you that you are great and we thank, that, thank you that you are Lord. And God, we just ask that you would continue to teach us how to submit under your Lordship as we follow your leading. In your name we pray, amen. And now for a quick announcement. Happy New Year, family. Thank you so much for joining us today. At the start of each new year, we join our Every Nation family of churches and ministries across the globe in a time of prayer and fasting. We want to invite you starting January 10th to seek the Lord with us. For more information, be sure to subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on social media. Now, let's prepare our hearts for God's Word. Good morning, Springs family. I pray that you're doing well. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, my name is Pastor Alberto and I serve as the lead pastor of the Springs Church. Uh, wherever you find yourself, uh, I, I pray, uh, whether you're in town or out of town, I, I pray that these past three days have been good to you uh, and that 2021 is off to a great start. Uh, I'm so excited uh, because over the next five weeks, uh, we're kicking off a brand new sermon series called Awesome God. And yes, this sermon series corresponds with our week-long prayer and fasting that we have coming up. Uh, but, but what this series, what, what I, my hope for this series uh, is that we're going to look at five different stories, five different moments where God encounters His people and how each encounter reveals a, a unique revelation of God's character and glory. And so the story that we're going to be looking at this morning uh, involves God and a man named Moses. Now, I'll be the first to admit that the story we're about to look at, if this is your first time interacting with the Bible, if this is your first time in a setting like this, uh, is pretty bizarre. Uh, in a quick read, it has some strange details, makes no logical sense. But as we begin to dive in to the scripture and consider the background, it reveals this amazing, glorious, uh, puts on display uh, uh, how wonderful and awesome our God is. So I'm so excited. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, and we're going to make our way through verses 1 through 15. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. If you open up your Bible. It's at the very beginning, uh, right after Genesis. And, and what we're going to do is I'm going to read some text and then talk about it and sort of make our way uh, through this portion of Scripture. So let's look at verse 1. This is what it says. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Uh, now, this is a, a very interesting way to, to start a story uh, because we're immediately introduced to Moses. Uh, we have some insight into his occupation, um, and uh, we, we see that there's a random character named Jethro, and Moses is in this land called Midian. Now, where we find Moses is not where he started. Uh, when we look at chapters 1 and 2, we actually get this uh, insight into Moses' life, and we learn that uh, as a baby, uh, he was rescued from death adopted by Pharaoh's daughter and raised in the palace. Uh, in other words, Moses was born a Hebrew man, but what we see happen in the scripture is that uh, he grows up as an Egyptian. He's raised as an Egyptian. Uh, he, he is uh, affiliated with, with all the privileges that come with being an Egyptian. And so Moses, who's trying to connect to his Hebrew ethnicity, we find out, uh, goes and, and he's among his people. Uh, now, what has happened in this story is that the whole Hebrew nation, the Israelite nation, uh, is being oppressed and under slavery and bondage to Egypt, to, to Pharaoh's kingdom. And so Moses wants to go be with his people, and, and he sees this oppression uh, uh, firsthand. He, he sees an Egyptian officer beating a Hebrew man. And so in a moment of rage, Moses uh, tries to take justice into his own hands. He, he wants to liberate his people from their oppression. So uh, he kills this Egyptian officer. Now, this plan ends up backfiring. Uh, instead, of, uh, instead of seeing his people liberated, they're, they're further enslaved. And, and now Moses uh, hears that Pharaoh has found out what he's done. Uh, the man who has raised them has found out what has happened, and he seeks to kill Moses. 
And in a moment of fear, Moses flees uh, as far away as he can uh, to a foreign land called Midian, where he's living as an exile uh, in fear of death. And, and what we gather from this first part of the scripture is that Moses has now, uh, t- uh, he, he's married uh, and he's working for his father-in-law and he's working as a shepherd in an ancient Near East land. And so uh, what's important to notice, uh, to point out, is that in between Moses uh, living in this kingdom of Egypt and uh, in, the, in the palace with Pharaoh, to where we see Moses now leading a flock of sheep in an obscure piece of land, 40 years have elapsed. 40 years have gone by, and we can conclude that, that Moses for the past 40 years ha- has been living in isolation working in one of the most lowest despised occupations in all the land, working as a shepherd. And here's what happens next. Verse 2 says, An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. Uh, Now, this is an interesting detail, uh, a quick change of pace in the story. Uh, God is revealing himself to Moses through a bush. Uh, Now, uh, it it raises this sort of important question, uh, why a bush? Uh, What's so significant about a bush? Uh, A few commentators have have pointed out uh, that bushes and rocks were part of the normal landscape in this part of land. Uh, Some speculate that it was an acacia bush common to that region, maybe a thorn bush. Uh, Regardless of the type of bush uh, that it was, the thing that caught Moses' attention was that this bush was on fire and it was not burning out. Uh, And and so uh, this is is important because Moses was a wilderness man. Uh, Moses has has given himself to the land. He he, he works the land. He's outside all the time. And so uh, in this day and age, it wouldn't have been uncommon uh, for bushes uh, or, or, or random vegetation to catch on fire because of how dry and how hot it was. But what catches Moses' attention in this moment is that the bush is burning, but it's, it's not burning out. Uh, if you've ever been camping and, and you try to start a fire, you, you sort of throw twigs into the fire and immediately uh, they're consumed um, and, 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 and there's no more fire. They're, they're reduced to ashes and embers. What's happening in this moment is that this bush is burning, but it's not being reduced to anything. It's not being reduced to embers. It's not being reduced to ash. There's, there's no uh, smoke. It just keeps burning. And, and this piques Moses' curiosity, and he makes his way towards the burning bush. And, and this would reveal that God's presence was inhabiting uh, through this normal piece of creation. Now, I, I know this sounds bizarre. I know this sounds strange, but when we consider this ancient Near, uh, Near East context, what God is doing is that He's getting the attention of a man, Moses, who was conditioned to doing the same thing every single day. For the past 10, 20, 30, 40 years, Moses is conditioned to doing the same thing every single day, and, and he's not thinking twice about his surroundings. And so at, at the same time, uh, what, God is, what God is doing is He's revealing Himself to Moses in a unique way that would capture His attention, while at the same time, He's revealing to us, the readers, that God has complete control and authority over all of creation, uh, that God has the ability to inhabit His presence into a normal part of creation, a bush, and completely alter the experience and the circumstance and the surrounding because He is God. That, that he can light something up on fire, yet it not burn or be reduced to ashes because he has complete control and authority over all surroundings. Uh, that, that, uh, that as, as we have mentioned before, that in the ancient Near East, that, that whoever could control creation, uh, this was an attribute that was reserved for God. And so God is revealing himself as one who is in complete control and authority over all creation. Uh, The second uh, miraculous thing that, that this moment puts on display, first is that God has authority over creation. The second is it displays the eternal nature of God and his self-sufficiency. This moment puts on display the eternal nature of God and his self-sufficiency, that God is completely self-sufficient. 
God is completely self-sufficient. And what does this mean? Uh, this, th- this means that, that God uh, does not get his energy from anyone or anything outside of him. God does not get his energy from anyone or anything outside of him. It means that God uh, does not grow tired. Uh, in other words, uh, like the burning bush uh, that, that just kept on burning and burning, uh, God never runs out of fuel. Amen. Uh, that his glory never runs out and it never dims. That his power is never exhausted. That he does not have to recharge. God's beauty never fades. He always keeps burning bright. You see, this moment of power and glory, as simple as it reads, actually reveals the eternal and self-sufficient nature of God. That God is uh, eternal, that that He never runs out and He's self-sufficient. That He doesn't need anyone or anything to contribute to His being or make Him exist. He eternally exists on His own accord. And so what does this mean for us? Uh, in His self-sufficiency, God can relate to us despite us. That, that, that God's relationship to us, that, that, that God interacting with us is not dependent on our performance. It's not dependent on our value. It's not dependent on our status. Uh, God does not need us to be God. And God does not need us to become something or someone for Him to relate to us. That God is, does not need us to have the right performance, the right attitude, the right mode of action and operation before He can become involved and do something in our lives. That God doesn't need us uh, to uh, attain this value uh, of self-worth or security or status so that He can begin to work in our life and reveal Himself to us. Uh, What this means is that God is not waiting for you to become the version of yourself that you think you need to be to experience a meaningful and life-changing relationship with God. That God in His self-sufficiency can engage with us, can interact with us, and His goodness never runs out towards us. That He is so self-sufficient that He can fully pour out His goodness towards us and it is not dependent on whether or not we're good. That He can uh, pour out His love for us and His love never runs out and He doesn't uh, stop loving us when we stop loving Him or when we fail to love Him. Uh, That God's grace never runs out. That He has lavished us with grace upon grace and this grace is not dependent on our efforts, on our works, on how great we think we are. That His grace is solely dependent on who He is and what He wants to do in our life. That God never stops delighting in us. Uh, That His delight in us never runs out. And and He does not stop delighting in us when when we remove ourselves from Him, when when we doubt, when we seek um, the approval of, uh, of other things in our lives. God does not stop delighting in us, in us rather. He keeps chasing us down. Uh, when we wander and we find ourselves distancing ourselves from God. God is this good shepherd that leaves the 99 and goes after the one. Uh, God is this good shepherd that is committed to us even when we're not committed to Him and He never runs out of energy doing it. He is completely self-sufficient. This is great news because He chooses to freely pour out His love and grace on us despite us. On our best day or on our worst day in Christ Jesus, God's love and grace for us will never run out. He does not grow tired. He is committed to us even when when we doubt our commitment to God. Even when we experience disappointment, God is steadfast in keeping us and loving us. And so here's what happens next as we continue uh, to read the story. God and Moses have this conversation. The Lord saw that he turned around 
And God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Verse 7, Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. God has seen the affliction uh, that, that this empire is pouring down uh, on His chosen people. God sees this people group suffering and marginalized. He sees their suffering. He says that He knows their suffering, that He's acquainted with their grief. And so this is His response to their suffering. This is His response to their oppression. This is His response to their affliction. It's found in verse 8, and it's the most glorious response uh, that, that God gives us to our sufferings and our oppression. It says, I have come down. Verse 8, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Parasites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel have come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Uh, One of the most beautiful mysteries of God is that he chooses to use broken, sinful people uh, to participate in his plan of salvation and redemption. You see, God is the true deliverer. God is going to be the one that delivers his people from their oppression and suffering, but he's going to use a human agent named Moses to enact that plan. And, and this is Moses' response. Uh, he says, uh, but, but, but who am I that, I that I should bring Pharaoh and bring the ch- children of Israel out of Egypt? In verse 12, he said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent to you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Uh, This is such an incredible uh, piece of scripture. Uh, Moses is having this this human moment. Uh, Who am I? Like, like I'm just a human. I can't lead a mass exodus of a whole people group out of of an oppressing nation uh, who has an incredible military force. I'm not capable of doing this. Uh, Moses has a very real moment of humanity here. And and God's response is so encouraging. It's so gracious. You see, God could have easily reminded Moses that he was the man for the job. Uh, God could have easily reminded Moses that, that we trained in Pharaoh's palace. God could have easily reminded Moses that this 40 year season of shepherding sheep was the training ground for shepherding people out of Egypt. God withholds all this qualification and affirmation uh, for one very specific reason. Uh, He could have affirmed Moses in his gifting, but instead of affirming Moses in his gifting, he chooses to affirm him by saying, I will be with you. Uh, what this means is that this leaves, this moves Moses from trusting in himself to trusting in God. See, what God is graciously doing in this moment is saying to him that you can, you, you're, you're the man for the job. You can, you can do this because I will be with you. And, and this is so gracious because if this depended on Moses' strength and his abilities, he would fail. But because the sovereign God who created all things is with him, he is more than able to do the thing that God has called them to do. You see, what Moses needed most in this moment was not a pep talk about how awesome he was and how great he was. What he needed most was to be reminded of who God is and who will be with him. And I believe this is so true for our lives today. Sometimes what we don't need is is to be reminded how awesome and great we are. What we need to be reminded of is how great and awesome God is and how that great and amazing and beautiful God is with us. And He is more than capable of overcoming um, and, and bringing victory into the areas of life that we feel inadequate. And I believe what God will do sometimes in our life is that He'll strip us of the things where we place our earthly trust in so that our lives can be rooted and built on Him. And our confidence and trust is solely rooted on the firm foundation of God's faithfulness. 
And, and so what ends up happening next is, is essentially what God is saying it, it is that God's presence will be enough to empower Moses for the mission that God has called them to. That God's presence would be enough to empower and embolden Moses to walk in all the things that God has called them to do. And this is so true for us today. Uh, that, that God's presence and power is more than enough uh, to empower us and, and embolden us to walk in all the things that God has called us to do. That God's power and presence uh, empowers us uh, to walk in faithfulness, uh, to walk um, like Jesus walked and to be like Jesus. You see, uh, for a brief moment, in time and space, uh, this bush that was on fire was the temple of the living God because God's presence on earth was inhabiting this space. And, and what's so incredible uh, about this moment is that we see in the New Testament, uh, God established His temple uh, God established us as His temple, and He puts His presence and His power within us. And, and we see this accomplished in the life and ministry of Jesus. You see, the same way uh, that God had come down to deliver His people from the oppression of Egypt, God has come down to deliver us from our greatest enemy, sin. God has come down to deliver us from the oppression and suffering that we are experiencing to the bondage of sin. And in the life and ministry of Jesus, we see God model perfect faithfulness and union with God the Father. And we see the life of Jesus on display, a life that says, uh, here is what living for God looks like because God uh, was, because Jesus walked on earth with God, with the power and presence of God inside of him. And then when Jesus uh, dies on the cross and he takes upon himself our sin, he liberates us from the bondage, oppression, affliction that, that we're experiencing from sin. He sets us free from the power of sin. He sets us free from ourselves so that we no longer need to rely on our own efforts, on our own strengths. We no longer need to say, who am I? Uh, all He liberates us so that we can say, wow, I belong to God. And now I am His temple and His power and presence can reside within us and we can experience union with God and we can walk with God and be empowered and emboldened to do all that He's called us to do. You see, the, the, the main theme of this scripture is how God's presence was with Moses to empower him to do, uh, to lead this mass exodus, to, to, to go on this great commission that God had given him. And, and now we see God establishing us as his temple, filling us up with his power and presence. And now we're empowered to walk in all the things that God has called us to do. In the same way that God started it with Moses and sustained him all the way through, he will bring it to fruition. And so my encouragement to you, my, my question as we come to a close, is are we partnering with God's presence and power and bringing him and inviting him into every area of our lives? Uh, the same way that, that Moses uh, was, uh, I, I love this story because God redeems uh, Moses' work and occupation. He, he reveals that, that in the most ordinary and mundane places and circumstance, that God's power and presence can come invade that space and it can become a place of worship. And I want to ask you, is, is your home a place of worship? Uh, where you are encountering the living God and experiencing His power and presence and being transformed by Him and empowered by Him uh, to go out into the world and make much of Jesus? Is your office space, is your classroom, is your building, is your car a place where you can experience God's power and presence and be renewed and transformed to go out into the world and make much of His name the way Moses did? Uh, see, in this new covenant that we're living in, we don't have to wait for God to come reveal Himself to us. He already did so in the person of Christ. And we don't have to go out into the wilderness and experience His presence in a burning bush when His presence is living and dwelling within us. 
And so my encouragement to you is as we go into this new year is to take moments to, to remind yourself and reflect on this truth that God is with me, that God is in me, and I have this awesome, intimate union and relationship with God. And let that relationship be the fuel that empowers you to walk in obedience, uh, to walk in confidence and security. Uh, to walk in faithfulness with Christ as you walk out in obedience all that He's called you to do. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. I ask that you would come uh, and, and Holy Spirit remind us of this beautiful truth that you've made available to us, that we have access to your power and presence because Jesus has come, lived, died, removed the barrier of sin, and now we can become holy ground filled with your power and presence. Lord, I thank you for every single person watching. Uh, I pray, Lord, uh, that, that you would give us uh, the unique ability and power uh, to draw near to you in all the ordinary parts of our life, uh, whether we're a uh, working mom, stay-at-home mom, unpaid intern, in the classroom, in the building, wherever we, we find ourselves working, Lord, I pray that we would experience you in those mundane areas the way that Moses experienced you. And Lord, would you continue to transform us in those places from one degree of glory to another. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning. Listen, I'm so excited to be back in person this Sunday, January 10th. We are resuming normal services, 9.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. So I hope to see you this Sunday. Love you. God bless. Mm -hmm.